We had seen with the Futurist that they had celebrated war. However, the mass destruction and chaos of World War I horrified other artists, where people were seeing that industrialization could be used for very brutal purposes. They saw the staggering loss of lives, widespread destruction of cities and homes, and natural landscapes. And in the end, the damage was profound, both physically and psychologically. And the art from this time period makes that very clear. Now, in reaction to the war, a movement known as Dada emerged. Dada artists believed that reason and logic had been responsible for the disaster of World War I, and that the only route to salvation was therefore to do the opposite, to court the intuitive, irrational, the nonsensical. Therefore, absurdity was a cornerstone to Dada works. But there's more. The way things had always been done now was also considered a culprit. So what we see often with Dada works is this, I think you could even use the word hostility, um, this hostility or this resentment towards the established order. And this included a rejection of artistic tradition as well, which makes sense, right? Tradition represents the way things have always been done. Also consider this. Consider the role that technology had in the war. It was technological advances that allowed for World War I to have an unparalleled level of destruction. And what allowed for technological advancement? The Industrial Revolution. So they were anti that as well. Some art historians, when they describe the Dada style, describe it as kind of like the anti style right? Because they're anti-tradition, um, anti-reason, anti-logic, anti-tradition. Um, and some even use like the term anti-art. And that's something that remains controversial even now. Some art historians don't think Dada's anti-art, but maybe just more anti um, sort of the, the traditions that art represents. And I do kind of fall in that latter uh, camp. I don't, I don't think Dada is anti-art because it actually, and we're going to see this, is really innovative and makes some, I think, really profound contributions to the history of art. Now, because Dada was anti-establishment and anti-art establishment more specifically, they didn't really want to be considered a style as we have been understanding it so far in this class, but more so they wanted to be considered a mindset. Also, to categorize Dada as a style would require some rationality and cohesion, which we know is a big no-no for this group of artists. So Dada is not going to be a consistent set of visual features like we saw with cubism and, and futurism. We can't sit there and make our neat little list uh, that's so straightforward. Um, what we're going to see more so is we're going to see these varying forms of critique, that mindset, um, and it will be articulated through a wide range of media. Even the name Dada as a, as a style name, um, we don't even know what that means. This remains elusive to scholars. Um, one possibility is it means nothing. It's basically just nonsense, a nonsense word, right? That makes sense in a style that's all about nonsense. Another possibility is it could be the French name of a child's toy like one of those hobby horses. Now this would align with the aspect of Dada that tends to be more humorous or playful. Then there is this anecdote about these two Dada artists who were conversing in Romanian. And the Romanian word for yes is da. And so it's like someone was talking and then the other artist was like agreeing, saying like da, da, da. And then someone else was like, oh my gosh, this should be the name of our movement. Now, this isn't completely out in left field because what we're going to see is that Dada did focus on language as it does represent culture and structure and rationality, all these things that these artists were against. Now, another thing that can be complicated about studying Dada is it is a style that had international popularity. And this makes sense considering that we are in a world war climate. 
Now, the style began in Zurich, Switzerland in 1916. And this location makes sense because what do we all know about Switzerland? It's neutral, right? So because of Switzerland's neutrality, it wasn't quite as dangerous. The censorship wasn't as severe here as in comparison to other European countries at this time. So, and this is, I think, unsurprising. If we look at the Dada style overall, it was the site of Zurich that produced most of the artistic innovation. Now, there were other uh, centers of Dada art production. There was a German approach, and this one was uh, particularly coming out of Berlin. And the Berlin approach emerged during the height of the Dada style, but it was relatively short-lived, only two years from 1918 to 1920. Now, out of all of the different regions of Dada, it was Germany that tends to produce the most political of the Dada works. There was a lot more going on in Germany at this time that was really um, doing much to provoke the resentment of the populace. Uh, primarily, it was government collusion with military and business that was really burning people up. So the result is that the Dada work that comes out of Germany tends to be more confrontational or even seen as outright protest. Now we have other regions. Um, we've got Paris, which out of the uh, different sites tends to produce the most negative and scathing of the Dada works. And then we have minor uh, sites in Romania as well as New York. We're going to be concentrating on this lecture from work that comes out of Zurich, Berlin, and New York. But for an exam, you would not need to know these different regions. Just know that everything is categorized as Dada. Now most scholars generally agree that Dada officially began with Hugo Ball and his performances of what he called sound poems. This is a great example of the innovation that characterizes the Dada style. To present performance as visual art had no precedence. This was the first of its kind. And we will tip our hat to Ball later when we uh, are going to be looking at performance art as it emerges in earnest in the 1970s. What Ball did was he dressed up in some sort of cardboard costume situation that I think makes him look kind of like a lobster chef. And he would recite these poems that basically consisted of random sounds right? Just whatever came out of his mouth, whatever came to his mind, that was the poem. Now this is right in line with the Dada spirit. First of all, totally nonsense. This costume is nonsense. These poems are nonsense. Second, this is a critique of language, which language is the epitome of rationality. And you know this. Think about when you write papers and all the rules of grammar and all the other things that you're expected to follow. Now I know what you're thinking. This guy is ridiculous. Yes, he is, and that is the point. His goal, and I quote, was to achieve buffoonery and spontaneous foolishness. This stuff was so out there. It was so weird, but so, so important. Think about it. This is being presented publicly. This was performed at the ca uh, Cabaret Voltaire. So it's a public performance rather than existing in the controlled environment of a museum. It's weird enough that it's going to get people's attention and it's going to encourage them to think about things like war, nationalism, tradition. What's ironic is from this sort of tomfoolery comes insight and critical inquiry in really meaningful ways. Now within the set of ideas that more or less defines Dada, there was a particular focus on the idea of spontaneity, of chance. The work we see here reflects this quite well, and we can even get that sense from the title. Uh, the work itself is based solely upon this idea of chance. Now, Jean Arp, he was a Swiss artist, and he had been working on cubist collages. So obviously, he is a synthetic cubist. 
but he grew tired and disillusioned with cubism's highly structured approach um, and also its analytical approach as well. So the story is that in frustration, you know, there was one day he was working in a studio, he's getting frustrated, he tore up the sheets of paper he was working on, he threw them on the ground, he looked down and was like, oh my gosh, like this is actually a pretty legit work of art just laying right here on the floor. And so he decided that he was going to start making work where he would tear up the paper into squares, drop it on, drop it on the surface, and then just glue down that chance arrangement. Although I am kind of feeling like there might be some slight adjustments being made. This feels a little too perfect, a little too grid-like uh, to just be randomly uh, dropped pieces of paper. But you know what? That's okay. That's okay to make some slight adjustments for aesthetic purposes. It's still based on the idea of chance nonetheless, and that's what counts. Now you might be wondering why chance? Why is this such a prominent feature of the Dada mindset? Chance is anti-control. Chance is a way of letting go, of giving in, whatever happens, happens. Chance well reflected the climate of Europe at that time. Chance suggests that things are always changing, that they're always in flux. And in the current political climate, it's not too hard to believe that people wouldn't be feeling entirely comfortable with control. Now there's some other implications with this piece that are quite important. First of all, this piece rejects the notion of artistic talent and artistic genius. These were well entrenched within the history of art. This idea that you had to have some sort of special innate talent to make a piece of fine art. Second, along the same lines, this is rejecting artistic tradition. The tradition was that to make a piece of fine art, it's carefully crafted. It's, um, you know, extensively considered. You probably are making studies and you're planning it out and you're modifying it as you make the piece. But here, you just throw scraps of paper on the ground, now you have a work of art. Now these ideas are going to be further interrogated in highly significant ways by fellow artist Marcel Duchamp. Let's take a look. In 1913, Marcel Duchamp started to exhibit his ready-made sculptures, which were mass-produced common objects. These are objects that are simply presented as fine art. There's no manipulation, there's no handprint of the artist, right? They're just objects, fine art. And in terms of art's tradition, that didn't really make sense. Kind of like what I was saying before, this carefully crafted, well thought out image, not just something that, oh, here's this object I found, now it's a work of art. Now let's look at this uh, term ready-made and let's uh, be a little bit more specific here, okay? First of all, with ready-mades. So the definition is that it's an object that the artist has not made, that they basically just set out and present as fine art. Now, some art historians feel a little bit more comfortable also in using the term assisted ready-made. With assisted ready-made, it's just the slightest of modifications. And my thought is you can use either term. I think that they both function effectively to describe what's going on. So because Duchamp came in here and painted this, right, this is not part of the original object, you would be well within your rights to describe this as an assisted ready-made. But because the object overall is just presented as fine art, ready-made is fine as well. Now one area though where we need to not be quite as permissive with our use of terminology is this idea of how does a ready-made relate to a found object. They are not one and the same. Okay, so this is not one or the other. Found objects, okay, yes, like ready-mades, they're objects the artist finds, they're not something the artist made, but Found objects are incorporated into a larger work of art that is made by the artist, right? So it's incorporated into a work of art where, again, ready-mades, just the object. Nothing's incorporated in, no object is being made. So for this ready-made, the fountain, this is probably one of Duchamp's most infamous works. It's a urinal. All he did was go out, 
by a urinal, urinal, turn it on its side, here's a work of art. Now I'm going to say this. This is probably one of the most important works of art ever made. How can I say such a thing? Well, what happened was, was Duchamp entered this piece in for consideration for a sculpture exhibit. And of course, it was rejected. And um, people were really sort of mystified by such an audacious entry. And they asked Duchamp to explain himself. Now, here's the important part. This is what makes this one of the most important works of art ever made. According to Duchamp, what made this a work of art was the fact that he chose it. He chose this urinal to be a work of art. He chose to turn it on its side. Essentially, what he is saying, and no one ever said this before, was that it was the idea that made art art, and that the object was tangential, really, and simply existed to just communicate this idea. I know. I feel the same way. I cannot emphasize enough how important Duchamp is to the history of art. This completely changes the way we see art, the way we define it. Before, it was just the representation, the art object that was the most important. But here, Duchamp is insisting it's the other way around. This is a huge challenge to almost all of art's traditional conventions. And that is something that is very Dada. Here we have another example of one of Duchamp's ready-mades, or you can say assisted ready-made, right? He took a cheap print of the Mona Lisa that he did not make and painted on a goatee and a mustache. Now you've got letters at the bottom and they can be taken one of two ways. If you look at them, um, and you can see in English, from like a phonetic standpoint, they spell the word look. Now if you say the letters all French-like, and I wrote out the phrase right here, it's elle est chaud au cool, which translates to she has a hot ass. So in this work, Duchamp is taking one of the most recognized, one of the most celebrated works of art that is considered to be one of the premier embodiments of ideal feminine beauty and is also considered to be a representation of its artist da Vinci's artistic genius. And he blurs, he blurs these gender lines. The image seemingly is female but yet has male facial hair. Then he overtly sexualizes this image by saying she has a hot ass. So it's kind of confusing from a viewer standpoint because you're like oh you know um, she's a hot ass yeah but then wait whoa like what's going on here and it, it's something that's a little bit complicated now Duchamp he said that this work was just having fun it's, it's a word game play on words through the title but our historians we are not buying this we call shenanigans on that uh, explanation because this goes a little further when you're selecting such an iconic, iconic work of art. He could have achieved this word game with any work of art, ready-made or not, but instead he chooses one of the most recognized works of all time. Art historians, they rightly point out that LHOOQ is a deliberate way of degrading the idea of the Mona Lisa as this widely revered cultural treasure that's been built up and built up so that it's now some sort of like untouchable iconic status. But yet, with just a few short strokes of the brush, he puts on a mustache and a goatee, immediately reducing the image down from celebrated masterpiece to kitsch, something that is made in poor taste, something of a joke. You know, and it is sort of amusing. I am chuckling to myself, as I am with the fountain as well. And this is that kind of humor and playfulness that I was referring to that can sometimes be seen in Dada art. Now, with both the fountain and LHOOQ, Duchamp is also leveling the same sort of criticism as Arp was doing with his collage based on chance, regarding this idea of artistic talent and genius, right? 
the perceived genius of da Vinci in this case, right? Um, and, you know, think about it. His ready-mades, they're not exactly the product of some innate talent. But I'm going to say this, in my mind, they are definitely the representation of genius. These ideas that these ready-mades represent, genius and revolutionary. Now here's another one. We get to look at three Duchamps in this lecture. How lucky are we? Duchamp is Rose la vie. So what Duchamp would do is he came up with this alter ego, this persona, Rose c'est la vie. Then this is also kind of like a wordplay. Now there's two R's here. This is not a mistake that I made. This is actually the way he spelled it. It's based off of the French word for love, Rose, E-R-O-S. And then you may have heard the phrase c'est la vie, right? So taken together, Rose c'est la vie is love, that's life. And what he would do is he would dress up as Rose la vie and he would make artwork and he would sell this artwork uh, under this pseudonym. So he did this series of portraits that he collaborated with his friend Man Ray, the photographer, where Man Ray took uh, his photo dressed in this persona and he even signs it here lovingly Rose la vie. Now the, the idea is, is you've got this like really close uh, vantage point and you've got this kind of like diffused light source to make this figure seem very like sultry. And uh, there's a sort of like slight flirtatious tilt to the head. And so, you know, the idea is, is that there's something very sensual, very alluring. And so at first sight, you're like, ooh, you know, pretty lady. But then you're like, wait a second, like... This is, again, very ambiguous in terms of, of gender. You know, this person has these, these uh, facial features that we recognize as more uh, sort of phenotypically as, as male. And so, um, you know, this idea of gender ambiguity, it's something that he's addressing in LHOQ, but he's also addressing through his, uh, you know, Rose la vie persona. Now, this is 1920. Okay, this is huge to be making works of art that deconstruct gender binaries, that make the argument that there's a fluidity of gender and that it's not just relegated to these two fixed categories of male and female. Now we can sit here and be like, yeah, yeah, we know that gender fluidity is a thing, but you know what? People weren't saying that in 1920. This is so ahead of its time to be addressing concepts that only now in the year 2020 and maybe within the past like year or two, had really begun to um, achieve a wider cultural consciousness. I cannot um, emphasize enough the importance of Duchamp in this sense. Right? This is really groundbreaking. Now there's another thing that's super groundbreaking about this and this is you know again something that's you know really kind of looking at subverting tradition. You have a long-standing tradition in the history of art of the self-portrait. The idea of the self-portrait is to show what you look like, right? And it's not just what you look like, but who you are as a person, your psychology, right? And again, long-standing artists have constantly been doing this throughout the history of art. What Marcel Duchamp does is he subverts this, where he disguises his appearance. He disguises who he is. This is something that is going to prove incredibly, incredibly influential to later artists of the modern and more particularly the most postmodern period. This idea of creating these uh, self-portraits that actually disguise the artist rather than as traditional show the artist. So later on when we're studying artists like Yasumasu Morimura or Cindy Sherman, I hope you think back to Duchamp as Rose la vie as a kind of inspiration for these interrogations of self, presenting the self, but also disguising the self from the viewer. Again, genius. Now, like synthetic cubism, there was a strong presence of collage in the Dada style. But we know from our uh, studies of synthetic cubism that we should probably be a little bit more detailed in our terminology. And that's definitely the case here. So this is collage, but it's a type of collage known as photomontage where it is pasting pieces of paper together, 
but this is particularly found images from magazines, photographs, etc. So images from mass media sources. Photo montage is particularly popular in the Dada style. Now in fact, if I can go back for a minute just to show you, see the second example. This piece here, Dada Sikht, this also is an example of photo montage, right? This sort of collaging together of images that have been taken from magazines, photographs, various found images. All right, let's go back. So, what we're having now, though, if, since we have, you know, this idea of synthetic cubism that we're talking about, let's do draw a distinction here, okay? So, keep in mind this idea of intent, right? So, with these um, Dada collages, right, they're put together in ways that are extremely complex, similar to cubism, but their complexity was a way to defy logic, to create images that really don't make any sense, where cubist collage, as we know, the main purpose was analysis. Now in terms of Dada photo montage, probably the best known artist to work in this medium was Hannah Hoch. And she was similar to other Dadas, Dada artists in that her works also were intended to level critique. But what sets her apart in really significant ways is that she leveled her critiques through the lens of gender. And that positions her as a very important early feminist artist. So this piece here is typical Dada. The composition is chaotic, it's contradictory, it doesn't make any sense. What she's doing here is she is using advertising material to criticize the way that it communicates feminine beauty norms. The title, Dashoni Medchen, that means beautiful girl. Now the context of this piece is significant because this image was produced during a time when modern advances were being celebrated for supposedly bringing about positive social and economic change for women. We can see, if you look at this image, she's taken all of these mass-produced objects, things like car parts and light bulbs, as a means to set industrialization against standards of beauty. The standards of beauty seen in things like this um, pretty uh, intense hairstyle, this carefully quaffed poofy hair, uh, this lady in a swimsuit, right, for example. So like other artists of the Dada mindset, Hook too is critical of the modern urban experience, which was informed by changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution. Now during this time, the current German government, the Weimar Republic, had granted women new freedoms, things like the right to vote and equal pay. But there was a tense political and economic situation, one that the government was causing. And it was making it difficult for women to actually exercise these rights. Now, of course, also, there's very little freedom in being expected to conform to impossible standards of beauty to receive social and cultural validation. So there's that as well. So taken all together, what Hawk is saying is that this notion of female progress that was being, you know, celebrated was actually largely superficial. Now to the right side of the composition, we have all of these BMW logos. And that speaks to the German economy's reliance on growing businesses, on corporations, which were again created, made possible by the Industrial Revolution. Now I want to offer the additional interpretation that these logos also speak to the idea of the com commodification of the female body, in which there's this wide range of products that are marketed to women that falsely promise to help them adhere to these beauty norms that are impossible to achieve. By encouraging women to conform to these expectations, their identity is marginalized, if not completely erased. And Hulk is suggesting this with a decapitated woman, with a light bulb for a head, here a head with no face, here creepy face, weird or even empty eyes. And what blows my mind about this piece is how relevant it is. This is made in 1920, and we can still see these very conditions being applied to women, even today, 
in the year 2020. And to me, that is a testament to the significance of Hannah Hoch as an artist. What we have seen in this lecture is really just a brief overview of a time of very complex art production. A world war, which I am so grateful I have not lived through and really hope never to, but a world war is an intense situation. There's a variety of factors involved, and we can see that the artistic reaction was equally as varied as artists are working to document all of the changes that continue to come about due to the Industrial Revolution. And this concludes our lecture on Dada.